It's right after the Carson show, right around that time. Oh, by the way, hello. This is Turley and this is Laura. How you doing? Say hello, Laura. Hi, hello, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is uh, installment number nine. And we've gotten up to the late 60s, early 70s. And yeah, these. so if you just happen to stumble upon this and you haven't seen the other eight sessions that we've done, go back on YouTube and find them because you might be interested in, in seeing some of the other stuff that we've talked about, talking about Turley's book, Blindsided, which was just published a couple of months ago. It's a memoirs and a life story about going blind and living and being in the music business. Yeah, kind of what we're doing with these is like it's a video synopsis, not totally chapter by chapter, but chronological. So it kind of gives you some insight of what, you know, what happened to me, the person and the artist. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I was signed to Lou Merenstein. I mentioned that before. He was my producer. He had produced Astro Weeks with Van Morrison and uh, Mary McKeeba's albums. He's a big time producer. And he had given me a song by, um, um, I can't think of her name all of a sudden, the folk singer, uh, uh, ba Joan Baez, Joan Baez yeah. that I didn't care for. It was a Bob Dylan song. I said, no, it doesn't do anything for me. But later on, I was going through somebody's albums, and I found a Dylan album. I was listening. I said, God, here's a great song. So I worked it up. It goes, my love speaks of silence. It's called Love Minus Zero, No Limit. And I took it back into Lou. I said, Lou, I think this would be a great song. And he started laughing and he said, sing it some more. As I'm singing, he turns on the Baez version. And I looked at him and smiled. Oh, you showed that to me. And he go, yeah, I did. <laughs> I said, I needed to hear Dylan sing it. So, cause Joan sang too nice and Dylan's voice gives you room to, to expand on it. So that, and we got all set up. We did everything with strings. And I mean, the big old thing, there was a little too string oriented for me, but it was, it was an excellent album. But we were finished, and this is in the book. This is a very important part of my life. I, um, I said to uh, Lou, I said, Look, can you set up a mic for my guitar and vocal? I want to do one song, not for the album. I just need to do it. I worked this up. It came from an Edwin Hawkins album. It's called, I Heard the Voice of Jesus. I said, now I'm not a Christian. It's not gonna be some sort of, you know, gospel thing like that. I just like the way it feels. And just, I just wanna do it one time. I did one take and when I was through, I was, I was so devastated, so weak, I could hardly make it over to the door and I couldn't hardly find the door anyway. <laughs> I opened the door and leaned against it. And I looked at them, I said, what the hell just happened? They were both crying. Lou said, I've never heard anything like this in all my life. I just got chills. Yeah, and yeah. so we went, I went out on tour. I was leaving to go on tour with the Moody Blues, and we made it into Kansas City, and there was a package waiting, and the package had a cassette player. Yay, back when they weren't, you know, didn't even have cassettes yet, hardly at all, with a cassette in it and the notes telling my driver, Jake, to play this for Turley. And he had gone back in the studio and added, a bass, a tambourine, electric guitar, a B3 organ, and it sounds like about 17 to 20 strings, very heavy in the cello area. And it was unbelievable. And it's called I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. You can find it all over YouTube. All over YouTube. Yeah, it's yeah. in my days of five octave range. And speaking of the five octave range, how I found that out, a guy named Professor Anthony Harabutz from NYU, who sounded like Paul Ann when he talked to me. Apparently, <laughs> you got a big voice. Well, anyway, uh, he went all over the world checking out ranges. And the way he based it, the, it was your lowest note all the way to your highest note with no break. If your voice broke, then you were out. And I had, according to his, uh, his, his thing, I had the largest male range in the world. And Ema Sumac had the largest female. Uh, Minnie Ripperton was the same as me, five octaves. And I don't know what uh, Mariah Carey, when she came along later. Uh, Mariah didn't have a lot of low voice, so I'm not sure if she would have been in the range. She could go high, no doubt, in the world. But uh, that song has followed me all ever since. I mean, I get think, people in Venezuela, if any of you are in Venezuela, hi there. We'll come down and see you guys someday. Um, 
<laughs> and a lot of funny folklore too that we found out. We had the the one uh, young man in Venezuela who contacted you and said he was so sorry to hear that after you sang the voice of Jesus, they had to rush you to the hospital to remove your throat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just to totally remove my throat. And then someone else down there thought I was an eight year old. Eight years kid. old, yeah. <laughs> if you hear of this single, uh, then you'll know that, that one would an be eight a miracle. Old. <laughs> that would be. They guy gave me an eight year old throat, sort of once. But anyway, you know, the album went out. I mean, my Moody Blues tour was great. Love Mount of Zero was the record, and it made top 50 Billboard. Could have made it all over. Warner Brothers and Atlantic 10 years later kind of blew it with uh, their promotion people not breaking the record in the east, midwest, part of the south, because in the southwest, northwest, and west, I was top 10 all over the place with Love Mount of Zero, and later on, I'll tell you about You Might Need Somebody. And Lou did put it on the album. Oh, yeah, Lou and put it on the album. this is the album cover from that album. Oh, yeah. I'm sitting right next to you, yeah. That's when I was pretty. You're so pretty. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but, um, that, that all that kind of led to the touring was going. I also did a show at uh, Philharmonic Hall, the Lincoln Center, with the Fifth Dimension. That was a nice uh, booking that I really enjoyed singing at such a place. I did some sing singing with Laura Nero, or Nairo, however she pronounced it. And Laura was great. We were perfect because she was a solo piano singer and I was a guitar singer. And we did some great shows together. And there's a story about the, her management contacted my management and the agency and was removing me from the tour. Mm -hmm. And there's a story in her about how she handled it, which was hilarious. It was really, yeah. really, really funny. So I think you'll enjoy that one. And see. we were recently told by a friend that her manager was a pretty high powered person in the business. There's no way to really confirm that but we can't deny it either so well, he, he became more powerful, more powerful who that later. is because we're just not sure but yeah, yeah uh, if that was the person on the phone it would be pretty amusing it was pretty <laughs> funny yeah and but you know the tours uh, uh one thing uh, i can say in my concert tour package just me and my guitar this one right here this old martin a microphone on my foot that i stomped the floor microphone on the guitar no plugs and a microphone in my mouth. And I was going up against bands, 15 to 20,000 people. And I was blowing the place as well. I, I really felt that I was probably an anomaly more than anything else because of that range. And a lot of them didn't like it. A lot of the people you were opening for didn't like yeah, it. Yeah, the opening acts, I mean, the headliners were cutting me from my hour show. That's one of them tried to cut me down to 30 minutes and we finally balked on that. But I did, I will say this, the people traveled with me used to count these because I didn't know since I couldn't see them. I was averaging about six standing ovations per 10 songs. And that was pretty, I always said, well, were they standing or leaving? They had to stand <laughs> up and leave, so, you know. But it was a lot of fun. I did a lot of things, uh, not going to lie to you, mismanagement, mismarketing. And Steve Miller and I talked about this in 2003. It probably has happened to 300 people. You know, it's just, it's a crazy business and I love it. I mean, I really do. It was a, thank God when I went blind, I was a singer. I didn't have to change some sort of, if I'd have been a pipe fitter or a plumber, I could have never had a job after that. So in the music, the only thing that changed my lifestyle. And I probably changed it to the worst. I went pretty crazy for a while. So, but that was the time of, you know, and being a non-smoker, a non-drinker, and a non-drugger, I didn't fit people in the business. It was pretty crazy. To so watch. instead, you turned to what activities that we would call more befitting of a type A personality. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I stand. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's me, all right. Yep. And um, I stayed on top of things. I kept saying, defeat is no option. I was not going to allow anything. Your mom's to, mantra. Yeah, mom's mantra. And it, it, it really helped because every time a, a wall would be in front of me, I would either try to go over it, under it, or around it, but I wasn't going to stop. I kept on going, and I was never going to stop. And I did that more for my mom. I mean, it, I think I did than me because mom was my strength. All right. So we'll see you next time. I guess, time. yeah, that was number nine, right? That was number nine. So.